So uh, one of the agencies which uh, Andrew Phillips de defined as having parental responsibilities for MM is the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Stats. So would you please welcome Martin and Louise from the ABS to speak to us. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Um, what's happened here? Okay, so um, I'm uh, the director of the geospatial solutions area, so we look after all the geography for the ABS and the geospatial data that we use. Um, and Louise is director of health section and obviously uh, our expert here on the, on the health aspects of our data that's in the ABS. Um, there's a bit of an outline there of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I won't go into a great deal of detail about what the ABS does. I think everyone here has a, a reasonable appreciation of what the ABS does. Um, so today we're just going to talk about uh, a little bit about um, what, what we can do from my perspective in terms of supporting something like the Monash model and the various uses that it might be um, applied to, such as we've seen here today. Um, talk about some of the potential issues that, that we encounter with our geography, which we will expect that, that would be encountered with something like the Monash model, and some of those issues have been mentioned already. Um, a few minor technical matters, um, and talk a little bit about um, what might be the future in terms of um, things like the remoteness areas and the, and the data that goes into the creation of remoteness areas and the urban centres and, and the Monash model. And then Louise will talk a, a fair bit about what health information is available and, and what that, how that relates to the Monash model. Um, so from our perspective, we think the Monash model is a, a really good example of a well-designed geography. So um, it, for, the, for starters, it's... Um, uh, a customised allocation of ASGS units. So from our perspective, that's really good because it enables um, a variety of people to put data together for the Monash model. And, and from that perspective, it's um, quite positive. Um, the criteria that are used are, are defensible and transparent. And that's really important from our perspective. All of our geographies, um, we try and use those, those types of principles. Um, and, and from our perspective, you know, we, we will see what we can do to support the Monash model in, in any way that we can um, through the so types of resources we provide geographically within the ABS. So the sort of support we're talking about there is, um, and Paul's already talked about this, that they have an allocation table that tells you which SA1s sit within, with, within each Monash model area. Um, but we also produce correspondences, and there was some talk about that before. So what correspondences do is help you to map between, say, postcode geography and Monash model, or SA2 geography and Monash model, or PRNs possibly in Monash model. Now, there's some, there's some constraints around that as to how well we can do that allocation, uh, and, and often um, there's quality indicators in our correspondences that indicate to the degree to which you can be confident with which the allocations have been done. I guess one of the advantages of the ABS correspondences is, is we, we will, in this case, probably use a population base to redistribute any population from one geography to another, where other correspondences that might be generated out of GIS just might use the area of the, of the, the, um, the units that you're looking at. And that's where um, the, the discussion before David showed where you might have a, a, a split distribution of the population within areas and that can have a, quite a um, poor impact on any reallocations you might, you might do. Um, we also have the capability to do reallocations based on different, um, different perspectives. Um, so that if there's specific applications, we can also do um, a more customised approach. Um, at the moment, the Monash model is not incorporated into the ASGS, so uh, the remoteness classification is. Um, I guess we see a point in the future where if we see enough general use of Monash model, there could be a time when um, Monash model comes into the ASGS, but at this point we need to um, wait and see as to the degree of adoption that occurs. There's an element of support that goes with incorporating anything into the ASGS and there's a decision that needs to be made at some point about when that support it warrants the amount of expenditure that we might put into that. Um, but that won't, as the note says there, that won't diminish the amount of support we provide, but we're committed to supporting Monash model for various analysis as it gets used. So, um, you know, there's no reflection in that on what we think of the Monash model in that regard. For those of you who don't know the ASGS, it's a very complicated diagram. Um, this is our main structure. This is the statistical area structure here. Everything we do is based out of these mesh blocks, and then we build pretty much everything up out, out from them. Um, 
So the remoteness classification sits over here and is built from SA1s and um, Paul did everyone a great service by ensuring that he used SA1s to subset the, the RA2 and RA3 areas uh, because um, that just means more data can be produced for those areas. Oh, sorry, probably wasn't Paul who did that, it was probably the original work, sorry about that. Would that be correct to say? That we, the original work uses SA1s to, to, to cut out the areas? Not sure? No, okay. Um, so that's, we've seen the picture of remote areas already today and, and that's a picture that we often produce of it, um, showing the distribution and the bands going out as we've discussed before. Um, the potential issues that we always run into with geography, and it's probably you know, worthwhile discussing this in this forum, is that um, often geographies are designed with a purpose in mind and, and they're often designed and built so they are fit for that purpose. And, and we see this with the case of the uh, Monash model where it's designed initially around um, the, doc the doctor workforce, but also there's some obviously been analysis done that shows that there's a broader application there. Um, but with few further use and adoption into and, and a wide variety of different applications such as in National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, we see that perhaps those uses identify issues with the model that's been used to subset areas um, and potentially down the, down the track we see this with our geographies where people come to us with different use cases and, and arguing for different applications of different models. And I guess from an ABS perspective, most of our models are very generic and, and we've, we've seen that in the criticism of um, the remoteness area classification here today in terms of some of the outcomes from it. It's only a five band classification and there's only so much you can do within those five bands. But when you start applying to different things like funding doctor services, then obviously you start turning up different issues. And I would expect with the, remote, uh, with the Monash model that you'll probably have similar things occur within the use of that um, geography in any analysis that you do. So th those are things that, you know, Paul and, and, and as a group, that you'll have to deal with going forward. Um, one of the other big areas that was touched on today is, is future updates. So um, up to this point, and, and certainly for 2016, we, we have been producing updates of remoteness areas and urban centres and localities every five year in line with the new information we get with the census. So with each update of remoteness areas, the boundaries do change. Um, there's some limitation on that change, but they do change over time and the boundary shifts out. And that shift in boundary shifting out often um, will have a direct impact on the Monash model. It will change the nature in the, of the model and will change the lines on the ground. And that will mean one person who was in an area previously may move to another area, okay? And that has direct impacts on the, the, the services that are associated with that geography and will have impact each time that change occurs. And so if it's incorporated into your design, that's, you need to make allowance for that in, in your management of your program or your funding, funding arrangements or whatever. And, and Paul highlighted that um, that's part of the work that they're doing around designing that, that whole system and how it's implemented within, within the funding arrangements. Um, and similarly with urban centres and localities, urban centres and localities change over time as well. So the populations go up and down, so that has a direct impact on the boundaries. The other one I'd highlight to you is the road network in Australia changes or the, con the, the, the transport network in Australia changes over time and that actually has some impact on the remoteness area classification as well. So there's a number of factors coming into play there that will result in shifts in the boundary and they're things that need to be thought of when we're, when we're thinking about what those updates mean through time. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, and as, as I said before, changes to boundary means some people are in and some people are out and, and that, will, that will shift. Um, so there's some technical issues we'd highlight from our technical perspective around having a well-defined coding scheme for, for a geography. Now I think Monash Model's got a reasonably developed coding system. Um, the, the boundaries need to meet established geospatial standards and, and, and Paul's talked about the ESRI files that are available and so ESRI is a pretty standard format so that's, that's good. Um, and that one thing we're emphasising more and more is that there's certain metadata attached to the geography as well so it can be used in a range of systems including um, allowing ease of access through, through web services and there are perhaps things I can talk to Paul about trying to, trying to help. Um, get those things more available through um, open data sources, etc., and things like National Map. Okay, um, one of the things I'd highlight looking further into the future 
is the ABS is, is undertaking some transformation in how it undertakes its statistics and how it operates. And, and that's going to change how we produce statistics into the future. Um, and we will be using administrative data a lot more prominently in what we do. Now that has a promise in the future of more small area data and, and I think Louise will talk about some of these things. Um, but as we've heard in the, in the, you know, if you've been aware of the media in the, in the lead up to the current census, there's a, at some point there was a consideration of whether the census would even in fact go ahead for the 2016 census. Now it is going ahead, the planning's going really well and we'll have a great census, but that debate is not finished, I don't think, and it may be that in, in five years' time or ten years' time, we won't have a census at, at, at that five-yearly point. And so that means the nature of the population data that is going into the design of things like remoteness areas and things like the urban centres localities that really underpin my national model may change in time. So we may in fact have more regular data coming in that allows us to do these things, but do we want to do, have a new remoteness area every year? I'm not sure we want a new remoteness area every year. We certainly don't feel like we want to do one every, every year. But it does change the consideration of there's natural time points that we currently have with the census being every five years and that equation we will expect to change over the medium term. So I'm just raising that issue because it's something we need to think of going forward in terms of the uh, degree of change that might occur around the underlying parts of the Monash model or even the Monash model itself. So it's an important thing to consider in the medium term. Uh, I'd just like to... Um, talk about the statistical spatial framework. So um, David talked a lot about some of the issues around geospatially enabling data, so some of the issues around geocoding. So the statistical spatial framework is an initiative of the ABS where we're trying to encourage um, all data custodians to better geospatially enable their data. And if we have better ge geospatial enablement of our data, we get much better results for things like Monash model, but we also get much better results for a range of geographies, it, including things like PRN. Um, primary health networks, is that right? Yeah. PHN, sorry. Um, so the, the, the SSF is something that we've been working with a range of departments and a range of custodians to try and encourage them to take a common approach to geospatially enabling their data. And we've been doing a lot of work around that as well to help it, allow that to happen. So we've certainly been encouraging um, certainly administrative data collections to collect and use location address, not postal address. And yes, there's an extra burden with that, but in terms of making our reporting easier and our data more meaningful, it's a really important change that has to happen. We can't keep relying on postcode. Postcode is an awful geography for trying to produce geospatial data for reporting. Um, um, David also mentioned that geocoding is a major barrier to geospatial enablement. Um, we certainly provide some guidance within the context of the SSF around how you undertake geocoding of your data and what are some of the best practices. But we've also been working in partnership with um, Prime Minister and Cabinet who are looking at um, making more of our geos foundational geospatial data available openly um, to the, to within government and, and within the broader economy. And so we expect very soon that there'll be an announcement around uh, freeing up access to the, the major ge geocoding data set that's available in Australia, which is called GNAF, the Geocoded National Address File. So we're, very confident that very soon we'll have an, a, an announcement about that becoming open a, a, and available for use. So that, that's something that's coming down the track which will really free up our capability to do geocoding. Um, the other issue raised um, by David was around confidential, confidentialisation and managing confidentiality in our data and, and the SSF provides some guidance around how we might do that with geospatially enabled data and geocoded data. I'd emphasise that when we talk about geocoded data, we don't just talk about an X and Y coordinate attached to the unit record or the, or the address, but also the, um, the mesh block. And the standard geocoding functions in, in Australia usually deliver both. And by having that mesh block, you're able to do more efficient allocation to ABS geography, certainly, and, and things like the Monash model. So there's some um, certain value in capturing that information as well. I'll now hand over to Louise to talk a little bit about health data. <laughs> 